this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for revelation. We'll take hold of it, be doers of it. We'll see the fruit of it. And we thank you for the great work you're doing in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're continuing to share with you on the subject of God's spiritual work in you. We've talked about the fact that we had to get a new spirit. That's what we began with. When we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we get a new spirit and a new heart. We talked about the fact that once we have gotten ourselves becoming a new creation, when we receive the Holy Spirit, who's received subsequent to salvation, we get our prayer language, begin to pray in tongues. We continue to get filled up with the Holy Spirit by praying in tongues and praising and worshiping the Lord on a daily basis for the influence of the Holy Spirit. We also talk to, begin to talk about the spiritual process of what God wants to accomplish, to bring restoration in the soul, to bring healing, to bring deliverance. We talked about the fact that it's through the Word. The Word is spirit and it is life. It is spiritual law. It is what we need to get in us. And we need to get the knowledge of the spiritual laws of God, which we took some time to talk about. So you get the Word in you, in your heart and in your minds, being written in you. You've come into a covenant relationship. And you're now to be a doer of the Word. We're to walk in the Spirit. We talked about that. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Him, a reasonable service. And we need to see a restoration work come forth in our soul. As our mind is renewed, we work towards seeing the spiritual mind of Christ be put on. And He wants to accomplish that in every single one of us, that we get the mind of Christ to think like Him. We also talked about the fact that we're building the spiritual house by the things that we do. God is doing the work, but he does it as you and I hear and do the word of God. We also talked about the spiritual inheritance, the blessings, the promises, all these things that belong to us that you and I are to possess. And the last time together we were talking about the spiritual kingdom, and we're going to talk more uh, about this. We're going to be especially starting out talking about our spiritual authority and operating in the kingdom. To see God's spiritual work in you, he wants you to get established in your authority and operating in the kingdom. Of course, how do we come into this? When we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, we see in John 1.12, as many as received him, you received Jesus, to them gave he the power. The word power is actually the word exousia, meaning the authority to become the sons, or this really means the children of God, and it tells you who are the ones that are the children of God, even to those that believe or are believing continuously, because this is a present tense participle. So those who are continually believing on his name, they're following him, they're seeking him, they're calling upon his name, they're walking his ways, they're doing what he commands. Those are the ones he gave the authority to become. That means you're not one yet, but become the children of God. And as we walk in the ways of the Lord, we grow up as we're to grow up as young children to get the word of God in us so that we come to the place of being sons and daughters before him. Now, when you are born again, Acts chapter 26, verse 18, reveals what has happened to us. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the authority, exousia again, of Satan unto God. You are not under Satan's authority any longer. You have been delivered out of his authority, and you are now under the authority of God through covenant relationship. And that's so now you can receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among all those that are sanctified. You've got to go through and receive the sanctification process of cleansing and becoming holy in the Lord. Now, we see also in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he's delivered us from the authority, again, exousia, for power, exousia, authority of darkness, and he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So you are now in the kingdom, which is a position of ruling and reigning. And the way you're going to rule and reign is through operating in authority, 
operating in spiritual warfare with the weapons and all the things that, that God has, gives us in order to see the rule and the reign of God come forth. Remember, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, He's made us kings and priests unto God. We are kings, we can now rule and reign. We are priests unto God, we now have free access into the presence of God. And he wants you to draw nigh to Him, of course, praise Him, worship Him, seek Him, come boldly to the throne of grace, take hold of the promises. But He also wants you to operate as a king, to rule and to reign over all of the works of the enemy because you have an adversary arrayed against you as Satan. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, because you're in Christ, you have the same spirit that Jesus Christ has, you're in the same position that Jesus is in. Ephesians 2, 6, He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Physically, you're not there, and you're not there as far as where your actual place of dwelling is, but the same spirit that you have is the same spirit that he has, so you're in that same position spiritually in a position of authority. You are now in a position of authority in the heavens in Christ Jesus because you have the same spirit, which means you can operate in authority over all of the works of the enemy. You can conquer every work of the devil in the heavens as well as in the earth and operating in you in your life. Now, in order to operate in authority, not only is it important for us to be born again and to see this work of getting you established in spiritual authority, you have to come under authority to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, Jesus entered into Capernaum, came a centurion, beseeching him. He said, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said, I will come and heal him, or having come, will heal him. The centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. That's because he was not in covenant relationship. He was not worthy. But he understood that Jesus could operate in authority because he understood all about authority. He said, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He goes along and says, for I'm a man under authority. And that's very important. In order for him to operate in authority, he had to be under authority. Who is he under authority to? To the Roman government. Because he was submitted and under authority to that which was over him, that put him in a position of authority to those who were under him. And he says, having soldiers under me. Otherwise, I am in a position of authority over them. I say to this man, go and he goeth, to another come and he cometh, to my servant do this and he doeth it. Otherwise, I operate in authority because I'm under authority. And I operate in authority by speaking, commanding words to those who are under me. And that is what you and I must come to the same place. He saw that Jesus was under authority to the Father in heaven and that he spoke commanding words to demons and sickness and disease. And he saw that the, the authority operated causing those sicknesses to leave and the demons to come out of the people. And Jesus heard it. He marveled and said to them and followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. That tells you something. Great faith is going to be based on operating in authority, authority under God, and authority operating by speaking, commanding words, and you know that they're going to be performed. Because you understand how authority works. And you are speaking in, with your faith to destroy the works of the enemy. This is absolutely imperative if you're going to conquer the enemy. Many people tried to conquer the enemy without being submissive and under the authority of God. That's a great mistake. They won't get anywhere. James 4, 7 shows us this. The first thing it says is submit yourselves therefore to God. That's first. Not second. Or not if you want to. You're supposed to submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So you're going to be able to resist the devil because you met the first condition of the first part of this verse, which is submission unto him. So you are to be under authority to God. When you're under authority and submitted unto him, 
then now you can operate in authority against the devil. And when you use your authority against the devil, he will flee from you. You will be able to conquer him in all aspects. Now, in order to operate in this authority, in the kingdom that we're now in, we do need to seek the ways that the kingdom operates in this authority. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if you're under authority, you understand how authority works, but you've got to seek first the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, and understand how this operates. The rule and the reign of God operates for those who are right with God, for those who are in relationship with Him, who those are submitted unto Him, and those who are walking in line with His Word. You certainly cannot operate in the kingdom if you are not walking right with Him. Evidence of that would be over in Galatians chapter 5, in verse 19, where it talks about the works of the flesh and starts listing them out in verse 19 and 20. And we come to verse 21, those they that which are doing such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that means you're not going to inherit it now, and you're not going to inherit it in the, in the future either, to come pass. Because part of your inheritance is the kingdom. Remember that you are heirs of the kingdom. This is part of your inheritance to rule and reign. James 2.5 Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? But notice, if you're going to be, operate in this kingdom and possess it as part of your inheritance and rule and reign and authority, it says which he hath promised to them that love him. Well, who are the ones that love him? The ones that keep his commandments. In other words, if you're not submitted to him, and how do we know that you are, are loving him? Because the word says in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you are keeping his commandments, that means you're submitted unto him. You're obeying what he tells you to do. Now, you're in that position of authority where you can operate in the kingdom. And without that, you will not be able to function in it. So, you won't rule and reign over the enemy. You won't see your inheritance be made manifest in your life of ruling and reigning, operating in the kingdom, unless you're keeping the commandments of the New Testament. Many people, again, try to operate in authority, and they're not walking in line with the commandments. They're not submitted unto God. They just kind of do whatever they want. They just want to learn about their authority and cast out the demons or take hold of promises, and yet they haven't come in line to operate in authority in the kingdom. And that is absolutely essential. Now, another thing, of course, we must know that God has given us authority over all the power of the enemy. Luke chapter 9, verse 1, he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power, dunamis, and authority, exousia, over all devils and to cure diseases. If you are truly a disciple, and a disciple is one who's following the Lord to hear and endure the word, you have power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And you are the one who's supposed to cast them out, operating this. Remember, Mark chapter 16, Verse 17 says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Every believer, that's every one of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are to do this. In my name shall they, the believer, cast out devils. You are to cast out the devils and to destroy the works of the enemy. You are to put your authority in operation. You are to work your authority. And that is so important. If you don't, the enemy will be able to work against you. Luke chapter 10. Many people are looking for somebody else to do something for them, but God wants you to engage in putting your faith in operation to command the demons to come out. Remember, it was the, he said he, he had the great faith because he understood how this thing operated. And you're going to work your faith by commanding the works of God to be done. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power. This is the word exousia meaning authority. I've given you authority, and what are you going to do with the authority? You're going to do something with it. You're going to tread on serpents and scorpions. That means they're going to be put underfoot. 
because you're going to release your authority to put the devil underfoot, which means you're going to destroy his works. You are going to do it. He gave it to you. It means every one of us, don't look for someone else to do it. They can help you, but you're the one who's supposed to be casting out. You're the one who's supposed to be using your authority. And over all the power of the enemy, the enemy does have power. Many people think that the devil should just leave because I use my authority. No, the devil has power and he's able to resist. We see that happen with Jesus. In fact, Mark chapter 1, we see a prime example. Verse 25, when Jesus was speaking to the demon to leave, and this is Jesus who had no sin, no demons, and nothing, nothing to hinder whatsoever. Yet, he said, hold thy peace and come out of him, and he didn't come out right away. The unclean spirit had tore at him before he cried with a loud voice and came out of him. Well, if he can resist Jesus, he certainly can resist us. Why? Because the demons have power. A lot of Christians have a hard time seeming to take hold of this. They just expect that God's going to just do everything, and it doesn't, the devil can't do anything just to hinder. It's not so. Here's another case, Mark 9, 25. Jesus saw the people come running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. How was he saying it, by the way? He was saying it continually, not just once. Present tense. Continuous, ongoing, repeated action. Did he come out right away? No. The spirit cried and rent him sore. I mean, if it rent him sore, I mean, he was really getting, going through the mill. And came out of him. He was one is dead, one dead. In so much many said he's dead. Well, that shows you that there can be lots of things go on while you're casting out the demons. They have power. They're able to resist. You keep casting them out, though, and kill until they, they keep driving out and coming out and coming out, and you will see them come out. And remember, there's a network of spirits. It is a little-by-little little process of systematically casting them out. Now, you've got to learn to use your authority, and you've got to learn to use it effectively. First of all, in dealing with the evil spirits that are in you, what does the Bible tell us to do? Matthew 12, 29. Else, how can one enter into a strong man's house? Who's the strong man? This is the one who's strong and mighty. Who's it speaking of? The devil. So the devil has power, and he's also strong and mighty. But you have power, and you are strong and mighty through the word in you, and through, of course, Jesus, his spirit in you, and you are strong, the stronger ones in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Notice, you enter into the strong man's house and spoil his goods, which would be all of his works, all the things he's done in your life, by doing what? First, bind the strong man. This is an operation of authority. When it says bind, this means to tie up. If I bind something in the spirit, I tie it up and stop it from working. Is that going to get him out? No. Is that going to be forever? No, because... The enemy will try to work against you and you can yield to him left and right and allow him to operate. What else do you do, though, when you first bind the strong man? That's a prerequisite for doing something else. Then he will spoil his house. The spoiling of the house is the plundering of the demonic house that's in you. How do I do that? By casting out the spirits. So binding is a prerequisite for doing something else. Many people say, well, I bind the devil. Well, that's good. And my question then is, what'd you do next? Well, what do you mean? I just bound the devil. That should solve the whole problem. Oh, you just tied him up so you can do something with him. Now you're supposed to cast out the demons and get rid of them. And that's important. If we don't do that, it's not going to get anywhere. Also, even in the heavenlies, we see the same thing. Matthew 16 Verse 19, I'll give into the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which is the rule and the reign of the heavens. Remember, this is plural in all cases in the Greek. We're not going to go through this. We've done this in the past, so we don't take the time to do it. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Heavens is plural. In each case, if you see heaven, heavens, and heavens in Young's, well, that's in the different one. But that was Darby's. He put it in. Not very many have done that. This is uh, 
Young's, in the heavens. So the point being is this is talking about the heavenlies, not heaven where God is, but the heavens where the evil spirits are operating. So this is talking about dealing with them up there in the realm of the spirit. He's given you the keys of the king rule and reign of the heavens. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be, having been bound, remember this is a participle, in the heavens. Whatsoever thou mayest loose on earth shall be having been loosed in the heavens. What does bind mean? It ties them up. Now, that's a prerequisite for me doing something else, right? And what does loose mean? Loose means to untie. Why untie them? That's also a prerequisite for something else. If I bind the demons that are operating up there, I stop their works. If I loose and untie what the evil spirits are doing, then I have untied their hold upon a place or whatever they're doing operating in the heavenlies. But is that all I do? No. You need to do more than that. Because God has given us authority to not just tie them up and stop their works. He wants us to get rid of them out of there. Look what he says in Jeremiah 1.10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and throw down, as well as to build and plant. So when I bind the spirits, what am I going to do next? I'm going to cast them down, throw them down, root them out. I'm not going to leave them up there. If I lose and untie their hold over a place or over a city or over wherever it might be, or a household, then I'm going to cast them down or cast them out, destroy them, root them out, throw them down. I'm not going to leave them there. So the point being is that binding and loosing is a prerequisite to doing something else. You bind them to tie them up and then you cast them out or cast them down. You loose and untie their hold, again, to either cast them out of a person or to, to cast them down from the heavenlies. And that is important. Many people have a tendency to just bind them and they think that that should solve the whole problem. Not so. You are to cast these things down. Another operation of authority is speaking to the mountain. A mountain would be some spiritual hindrance on the outside that's affecting you in some way. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Unfortunately, this is not a good translation, so you lose some things. First of all, we do say a commanding word to a mountain. Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. You don't ask God to get rid of it, like Paul was wanting God to get rid of the, you know, the tax that were coming against him from the evil spirits and talking about Paul's thorn, the, the messenger of Satan sent, sent at him, buffeting him continually. No. He gave, tells you to do something with it with your authority. You're going to speak to that mountain or hindrance or blockage to what God has for you. And if you're not seeing something come to pass on something from the outside or affecting you, you need to speak to that and command that to be removed. You cannot doubt in your heart. You've got to believe what you're saying. You shall believe that those things which he saith. Now, am I only supposed to say this one time? I command the mountain to be removed and just believe it's gone. No, that is error teaching. Why? Because remember, the devil has power and he can resist. So what would be the right thing to do? Keep speaking and keep speaking and keep speaking, releasing the authority and power until he is removed because he has power to resist, remember. So, what's the answer then? The word saith is in the present tense, showing us what we're to do. Saith would mean says and continues to say. So, we believe that those things which we say and continue to say, what are we saying? Commanding words for the mountain to be removed, but we continue to say over and over and over, commanding that mountain to be removed. Now, another critical part. When we say that, do we believe that it will happen sometime? No, that's a mistake because that's not putting faith in operation. Faith is put in operation now and it has effect now. How do we know? 
Because this is your faith in operation, by the way. If we go back a verse, remember he's saying about have the faith of God here, and then he's telling you how you speak to a mountain with your faith, and the next one's about the prayer of faith when you take hold of promises. So this is talking about using your faith. When it says, shall come to pass, it is not right in the Greek because it is not a future tense verb. It is a present tense verb. That's different. If it was shall come to pass, it would be future, but it's not. It's present. Present, remember, again, means continuous repeated action or ongoing action, and it's happening now in the present. So therefore, this would say, shall believe that those things which he's saying and continuing to say are coming to pass. Present, continually happening, are coming to pass. This is critical. When you speak, do you believe that that is coming to pass every time you're speaking and it's happening now? If not, you're not in faith, you're not operating in authority, and you won't see results. Many people just think it shall come to pass. No, faith is always operating every time you are speaking. Then it says you'll have whatsoever he saith, and it will come to pass. So it's critical that we learn to understand how we are operating. Every time you command a demon to come out, it's happening. The power and authority is going for to drive that demon out. Every time you bind or loose those spirits in the heavenlies, remember what it said, it shall be. It happens. Why? Because the angels go into operation having been showing the fact that what happens, the angels having been in operation in the heavens to bind, have them bound or loose. So it is going into operation every time you speak. But again, the big thing you have to understand in operating authority and power is the enemy has power to resist. This is why we go back to, for a moment, to Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I have given to you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, which is you're going to put them underfoot, and over all the power of the enemy. Serpents and scorpions would be what demons' effects do. They bite you or they cause problems. Then it says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. And we pointed this out before, but it's important to point it out again. This, again, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Is that future tense? A statement of fact that that's going to happen automatically? That's why people have thought that, see? Because it says shall. Well, is that what it's saying? No. It's not a future tense verb. And furthermore, it is a subjunctive mood, which is very important because that is a mood expressing a conditional statement. The conditional, it has to condition to come to pass, has to have conditions met. Therefore, nothing shall by any means hurt you if you meet the conditions. It's not going to not going to hurt you if, as long as you meet the conditions, which is what? Using your authority to tread on the serpent scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. You've got to start speaking to these and start conquering the enemies in your life. That is so important. Another thing, using your authority in intercession as well as in dealing with pe things from inheritance or when you're even praying for other people. You're going to remit sins. Why have curses come? Because of sin, there's a cause for it. Do you have authority? Yes. Can you remit sins, which means to send away the effect of sins? Yes. Why would you do this? Well, one example is inheritance. Remember what it says? We'll come back here in a moment. But over in Lamentations, chapter 5. Verse 7, look at this truth that's declared. Our fathers have sinned and are not, meaning they've passed on, they're not here anymore, and we have borne their iniquities. That means the sins of our forefathers have caused the effects of bearing the iniquities in our life. 
And what happens when the iniquities, they bring the curses upon us. And they're visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, if they're passed on, what can we do about the sins? Well, they can't confess them. They can't repent from them. In fact, they've already come into us. They don't even matter, really, in a sense. But we've been affected by them. So that's important. If we, you and I have been affected by them, what can we do about it? I mean, we didn't commit it to cause it. But nonetheless, sin has worked to cause the bondage or the evil spirits or whatever has happened to come into us. We have authority to send away the effects of the sins. That's what remitting is talking about. Wherever sins you remit or sent away, they're sent away unto them. You can remit those sins away from you, send them away, so they don't have an effect upon you in your life. So we do this in dealing with inheritance generational. We also do this in dealing with as far as sins and when we're interceding for someone. We're going to remit the sins. They have, they're going to have to come to repentance of them themselves. But we can remit the effects of sins in a person which can help as you're praying, as well as you're going to be binding the spirits, loosing their hold, and thanking the Father for bringing them to repentance, and in labors, you're going to be praying several things to help a person deal with the problems and come to repentance in their life. But you have authority because sin has to be dealt with because that's the cause of all these things. So if it has anything to do with outside of your own sins, which you would confess yourself and come to repentance, you can remit the sins of your forefathers or the sins of somebody that might have done something to you if you've been victimized. Of course, you've got to forgive the person if they've done something and you can't have unforgiveness or resentment or bitterness. You've got to make sure you've dealt with it. But you can remit the sins of those that have affected you. And then, of course, what are you going to do then? That breaks the right of those spirits to operate there and it breaks the... the cause of the curse, but it doesn't get rid of it. Remember, there's two aspects to a curse. Proverbs 26, 2. As the bird by wandering is the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. That means there's a cause for a curse. What is that? That's the sin producing the iniquity, which is what is visited upon us. So, if that's the cause, but there's more to it than just dealing with that, there's something also that comes in through the open door of sin. And what is that? That's the evil spirits that come in. Because when you sin, it's not just a problem of sin, it's more than that. And this is what the body of Christ has not understood. They thought that all was just sin and they didn't have to deal with the devil at all. But no, when you sin, you give place to the devil a place of residence, and you allow evil spirits to come in. That's how they come in. They've come in from inheritance, they've come in from our own sins, and they've come in from victimization. This is why you need to remit the sins in your own life, of course, you need to confess the sins and overcome and conquer uh, the problem areas and correct them in your life. So, you and I have authority to bind, tie up, to loose, to untie, to cast out demons, that means to throw them out of us, cast them down from the heavenlies or where they might be, remit, send away their effect. We can speak to the mountain, command it to be removed continually, knowing that every time we speak it is happening. And we also, regarding attacks that come against us, we are to, as we saw already, we are to use our authority to resist the enemy. James 4, 7. Remember, when you <clears throat> submitted yourself to God, submitted to his authority, well, then you're going to do what else? It's not just submitting to God. You also need to do something dealing with the devil, don't we? Resist. Set yourself against the devil, and he will flee from you. And you're going to do that by sp speaking the word. Jesus resisted the enemies. It is written. Or just simply speaking and resisting their attacks of what it might be against them, commanding them to leave in the name of Jesus. And when you do this again, this is going to be something that you're going to have to do steadfast as well. When Jesus resisted the devil's first temptation, he came with another one. And then he came with another one. You know, the enemy can come against you, and you're going to have to resist him steadfast. <coughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 
Be sober, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, does that mean he can just come in and devour anybody? No. Because when it says seeking whom he may devour, this is a subjunctive mood verb showing you that there has to be conditions for him to be able to bring a devouring in your life, which is what? The open door of sin, when you give place to him for him to operate. But as he's trying to get to you, what do you do? Whom resist steadfast in the faith? Now, this is not what you do to get demons out of you. This is what you do from the attacks that are coming from the outside. Some people say, well, I resist the devil, and I wonder why I still have these problems. Well, if you have demons that are in you, that didn't get rid of them. That at best will shut down what's in you. I've had people say that to me for years. I, re I resist the devil. They've come in and say, I resist the devil all the time, and I, these problems are still here. Well, it's because they had demons in them. Resisting is at, for the demons in you at best will shut them down only for a season, but it will not get rid of the problem. You have to cast them out when they're in you. But resisting them is resisting his attacks that would come against you. You need to use your authority to resist the enemy's attacks. So he'll flee from you so, you don't, so he doesn't get to you. Otherwise, you should always be operating in your authority in some aspect. Whether you're binding to cast out or binding to cast down. Or whether you're loosing and untying to cast out. Or loosing and untying to cast down. Or whether you're speaking to the mountain, commanding it continue to be removed, and, and knowing that it's happening every time until it's removed. Or whether you're remitting sins and then doing something on top of that. Casting out, casting down, buying the spirits, whatever it might be. Or you're speaking to the mountain again. Or you're resisting the enemy steadfast. These are all things that are important if you are going to get victory. You're going to use your authority. And when you operate in authority, you command. We've already seen the commanding statement that's made. Here's a good, another good example. Acts chapter 16, verse 18. This is the woman who had that spirit of divination that Paul cast the demon out of her. How did he get rid of it? Notice what he said. Acts 16, 18. This did she many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command. He spoke commanding words. And who did it? I command. Not, oh, I'm going to pray for God to get rid of this, or I'm going to have God command. No, you are going to command. Oh, I'm going to have somebody else command for me. Well, they can help you, but you know what? Every one of us needs to get involved. You need to command. Put your faith in operation and start commanding these spirits to come out. I command. And when we command, did we just command one time? No. Present tense. He was continually commanding this spirit in the name of Jesus to come out of her. In this case, it's a good example of showing that you can have a battle just to get this one spirit out, apparently. Did it come out immediately? No, it came out the same hour. Huh. He might have been going 59 minutes, you know, and so many seconds before it came out. It doesn't tell you exactly, but obviously he had a battle. He was continually commanding the spirit to come out until it came out. That shows you that authority is continually to be released by speaking commands. You speak commands in line with the word. You always do everything, by the way, in the name of Jesus. Don't be commanding and then not speak in the name of Jesus. It's not going to do anything because the, your, you don't have the authority. The authority is in the name of Jesus. It's been delegated to you, but you must speak in the name of Jesus. I see some people, you know, they don't speak in the name of Jesus. That's a mistake. You don't just, I command this devil to go. I command the devil to, go, to leave in the name of Jesus. Or I command this mountain to leave in the name of Jesus. Or I cast out this demon in the name of Jesus. Always speak in the name of Jesus because that is the means of authority to drive the spirits out. Now you have authority. You are to use spiritual weapons. The spiritual work of God is that you're going to use spiritual weapons. If you're trying to deal with things in the flesh, you're not going to get rid of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 10.3 Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Walking in the flesh means we have a physical body. Do we war after a, with a physical body? No. The weapons of our warfare, and these are spiritual weapons, 
They're not carnal. So why would we try to do anything in the flesh or in the natural? That apparently is what Paul was doing. He, he, you know, he's trying to deal with things in the flesh. And then he you know, tried to get God to get rid of his problem. Instead, God wants us to use the authority and use the weapons that are given to us, the weapons of our warfare. And see, Paul, he got the revelation of all these things as he's seeking the Lord, and he understood how to do this. He had to grow in everything, just like you and I do. The weapons of war, our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh. They're po powerful. Mighty is the word donatos, which means powerful. They are powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The word pulling down really means the demolishing and destruction the weapons that God has given you will demolish and destroy the devil's works. Strongholds, whatever it might be, fortresses, well, it doesn't matter. In this case, it's talking about in the area of the mind. So God wants you to know that you have authority and you are going to use these weapons. Remember what it says back in Jeremiah. In fact, we have a song we wrote, which is after this, it's in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. Who's he going to use? He's going to use you. So as you're using these spiritual weapons, he's also, you've got to realize that you are a spiritual weapon. You are a weapon of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations. With thee will I destroy the kingdoms. God's going to use you in the spirit to destroy the works of the devil. You are going to operate in authority. You are a spiritual weapon. And that's why you are to understand you are to operate in the spirit in warfare as a soldier in the army of the Lord. Spiritual warfare is every believer's activity that should be operating in them. 1 Timothy 1.18, speaking about Timothy, I charge thee, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. You're to war a good warfare in conquering all the enemies, whatever they might be doing in your life. And then in 2 Timothy, he speaks further about the situation. When he comes down here to verse 3, he says, Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The hardness refers to evils, hardship, troubles, attacks that come. You will have the attacks that will come. You know, the enemies aren't going to leave. Everybody has a little bit different situation depending upon what all's in you. Or whatever all's coming at you, whatever it might be. You're going to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Don't cave in to the pressure. Don't cave in to the attacks or the afflictions or whatever it is. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord, and you are in war to conquer your enemies. Verse 4, no man that warreth, well, that means you're to war. And what are we doing? We are involved in a spiritual military expedition as soldiers in battle. Spiritually, you are fighting using the authority that's given in you as a king to rule and reign over all of your enemies. So. You're actually, it says, they're involved in military duty, active service, to be a soldier. You're in active duty, spiritually, for God, as a soldier in the army of the Lord. No man that is warring entangles himself or involves himself with the affairs of this life, outside of what you need to be involved in and just functioning in daily life and normally, uh, you know, carrying out what you need to do in the job that you have. Too many people, many times, I mean, they, they do those things, but then they do all these other things of, in the worldly life situation, which is total waste of time. It's not what God wants. He wants you to war against all these enemies, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You want to please God. He's chosen you to be a soldier. You are a soldier in the army of the Lord, and you're to conquer them all. Now, if, any man, if a man also strive for masteries, and this word means to be contending in a contest for the prize. And you and I are in a spiritual contest, a spiritual war 
well, the prize of being the victor over the enemy and conquering him. How are you going to do it? You're going to strive for the masteries, yet is he crowned, or the victor in a contest this refers to. How can you be a victor? Well, you've got to strive, engage in this lawfully. Well, how's that? What's that mean? It's got to be according to spiritual law. I mean, you can't do things your way. You can't do things in the natural. You can't do things other ways through what the world will tell you what to do. No, you're going to do it according to spiritual, spiritual law, and you're going to operate according to it, which means, of course, you're going to have to walk in line with the Word of God and be right with Him, righteous. But you're going to strive lawfully. You're going to be doing things according to the Word. We see a lot of people out there that do things their way or do things contrary to the Word. Listen the way I do it. Is that in line with the Word? No. What are you doing it for then? You're not striving lawfully. You're not doing things correctly in line with the Word. What the Word says you to do is what you're to do. And if you do it, then you will see the results. God wants us to engage in the warfare. It is a spiritual fight, remember. You're going to engage in a fight. This means you cannot be passive when it comes to spiritual enemies. Fight the good fight of faith. This is, again, contending with the adversary. Fighting. It's a good fight because you're going to conquer the enemies and you're going to overcome them in your life. But you've got to put the word in operation. You've got to engage in the spiritual fight regardless of what happens. You know, many people think, well, the Lord's just going to open up the door and everything's going to be fine. Well, He will, but does that mean everything's just going to happen just because He opens up the door or things happen? No. Look what it says. Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me for preaching the gospel. Great, everything's going to happen. There can be any problems at all. No. There are many adversaries. You still have to take on the adversaries regardless of what is open done to you. It's not like he opens it up and then, or you get you know, some revelation of this or that, and then everything's going to work fine. Or this works out for me, and uh, smooth sailing from now on. No, there'll be adversaries. You are going to engage in spiritual warfare with your authority, conquering the enemy on an ongoing basis. This is not only true in casting out the demons, but this is also true in dealing with spirits in the heavenlies. Remember, what are we to do? Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This refers to having a spiritual strength because of power dwelling within you. Strength is because of the word en dunamo, in, en, dunamo, power. Power within produces spiritual strength. How do you get power within? Through the Word. You've got to get spiritual power. God's Word is the power of God. It's resident in it. As the Word comes into you and it's abiding in your heart, it's producing the spiritual power which produces spiritual strength in you. And in the power, there's a different word. This is released power, power that's being released out of you with force, with mighty force here, this means. So the power released out with mighty force coming out of you. Meaning, what's the purpose for you to get this armor on, which is what we'll see in a minute? Have power within, have power released out. Put it in operation with mighty force. What's why? Because you've got to conquer the enemy. It goes on and tells us what we're doing. How do you do this? By the way, we just back up for a moment. When it says this, be strong in the, in the Lord and the power of his might, this is an imperative command. It's commanding us to do it. It's to be an ongoing thing occurring in our life, present tense, but it's passive voice, meaning you don't do it, God does it. Well, how can God command me to be continually empowered within and manifesting power out with mighty force? It's a command to me, and he's doing it. Well, what's my part to play? Your part to play is to put on, clothe yourself with the whole armor of God, which is the word in your heart, the word in your mind, the word in your mouth, and the word directing your steps. The word running your whole life. 
If the word's not running your whole life, you don't have the armor, whole armor of God on. And remember, this is an imperative command as well, imperative mood, and it's a middle voice, which means you're clothing yourself for your own benefit. You clothe yourself with the whole armor of God, and what's going to be the purpose? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, or have the word is dunami, which means power. To be able to stand, for your being able. Now, when they put may in there, that's not good, because that makes you think it's conditional. No, it literally says, for your being able to stand. Being able, it's an infinitive, meaning the result of you putting on the whole armor of God, you will have power. You are able, have power, to be able to stand against the enemies. This is another infinitive. There's two infinitives in a row here in the Greek. Against what? Against all the wiles, all the tricks, all the strategies, anything that the devil would bring against you. So, if you and I don't put on the whole armor of God, are we going to be able to spiritually war effectively? No. And this involves the word in you in all aspects, where the word is in you for mind, uh, will, uh, in, your, in your heart, in your mind, in your mouth, and directing your steps. Now, what is the purpose that we're doing this for? Verse 12, because we're engaging in warfare. We're using our authority, conquering the enemy as kings. You're a king to do something, to operate as a king. Notice what he says. Well, does that mean I'm just going to say something and there won't be any problems and just I can do whatever I want? No. You're going to be wrestling. You ever wrestle? Wrestling is not you, you're, you're continually exerting force and effort and power and strength to, to overcome a, a, an enemy, right? You're wrestling a contest, but not against flesh and blood, not against people. But you are wrestling in the spirit against evil spirits, showing you it is a battle. It is a contest against principalities, against authorities, this means ex ex exousia, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, of this age, more literally, against the spiritual wickedness in the high or heavenly places. This is talking about Satan and all of his spirits operating in all their different levels of functioning in the realm of the spirit. So you putting this on for warfare. The purpose of the armor of God on is for you to put the power of God in operation in warfare to conquer the enemies. So you got to start operating in this. And these are all spiritual weapons that you're going to use. It even talks about here the shield of faith. You speak forth to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. What did Jesus do? He spoke the word. It's written, shield of faith will be put up when you speak the word to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And the next verse talks about the sword of the spirit. The sword, what the helmet of salvation, by the way, a helmet covers your mind to protect you from the attacks coming against your mind. The sword of the spirit is where you're going to be smiting somebody you come in contact with. And it's the word, which is the rhema, which means something spoken. Otherwise, the word's not just going to be sitting in your mind and heart, and that's it. You're going to be active. You're going to be speaking it against the enemy's attacks, shield of faith. You're going to be put in an operation to smite the enemies. That's what you're going to be putting your sword in operation. So you've got to engage in spiritual warfare. And you're going to use a spiritual weapons, and you're going to use a spiritual sword. This is all the part of the spiritual work of God being accomplished in you. Now, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Your mouth is the spiritual sword being put in operation. When you speak, then you are putting your sword in operation. The word in you doesn't mean the sword's doing anything. No, it's not. It's in operation when you speak. Some people say, well, can I disbelieve? Well, you believe, but what else? You need to speak, because that puts your faith in operation. 
not just believing, you got to speak to release your faith as a sword against the enemy to smite the enemies and see them be destroyed and put underfoot. You got to get this sword in operation. In fact, you always, regardless of what you're doing, you always need to have the weapons at hand, all the weapons that God's given you at hand. We can even see this in Nehemiah chapter 4 when they were going to, to fight against enemies as they were building the wall, which is like you building the things in your life. Look what it says in verse 17. They which build the wall, and you're building the things of God in your life, the spiritual house and the things that God wants. And they that bear the burdens, those with laden, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, doing the work, and the other hand held a weapon. You've got to always be engaging in the warfare. You've got to have your spiritual weapons at hand, in your hand, which means you are ready to deal with any attack at any time. Nothing should take you by surprise. You are ready to deal successfully. And the enemy's not going to sneak up on you. You've got your weapon in hand. You need to put it in operation. You are his battle axe, remember, and you're going to fight. So you need to get your, your weapon in hand. And how is your weapon in hand? When your mouth is operating. This is why God wants you to be speaking things out of your mouth. 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. Eleazar, one of the son of Dodo, the eighth Aohite, he's one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. What did he do? He arose and he smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. How do you smite him? With a sword. How does this how did this the sword work? Your mouth is working. So how do you smite the enemies? Your mouth's working. You make your mouth work. You can't make your mouth speak. Well, your, the flesh doesn't want to speak. It doesn't matter. You make your mouth speak. You do it. You make it speak. His hand clave unto the sword. He didn't let go of it. That means you don't stop speaking. You keep speaking. You keep speaking. You keep speaking. It's one of the things, though, you know, you get kind of tired physically after a while. That's why those cast-out sessions on, can help you because they'll, they're like the Energizer Bunny, you know. It'll run forever, you know. Just put it on and let it keep going. Or you can keep speaking. Then when you kind of re, regroup, get your mouth in operation and speak. You need to speak. Some people, though, they just have a tendency just to rely on those. I mean, they're going to help you, but nothing's going to be replacing you speaking. You need to put your faith in operation. You need to be speaking. Don't rely on just that. Some people hardly, I've had them say, well, I've been listening to this. I say, are you speaking too? Well, no. Well, you need to put your faith in operation. You're just kind of agreeing with it, but you're not working your faith. It's working against them, but you need to work too. And that's important. So, your hand clave into the sword, that means your mouth's in operation continually. And... It said until his hand got weary, so there'll be a lot of smiting. You're going to be doing a lot of smiting with your mouth. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. God will give you the victory. What's the victory that overcomes the world? Our faith. How's your faith in operation? You believe, you speak. Your hand cleaving to the sword is your mouth in operation to conquer all of these enemies and to speak forth and put the authority in operation. Another thing that you're going to do in seeing the spiritual work be done is you are going to engage in spiritual force and violence. This is not a fleshly force and violence. We're not going to get in the flesh. Some people think, well, if I just scream real loud, that'll do it. That has nothing to do with it at all. It's nothing to do with that. Spiritual force and violence is where you are commanding the evil spirits putting forth the force and violence out of you with an attitude of violence would be an attitude of destruction of those enemies. Certainly, you can't be an operating in force and violence if you are passive. No. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time, the kingdom of God's preach, and every man presseth into it. Beyadso, which means to use force and inflict violence upon you. You do it with your mouth in a normal tone of voice, but you're operating with authority and you're speaking commanding words to get rid of that enemy and inflicting violence upon him and using spiritual force to 
conquer the enemies. This is true when you're casting out the demons. This is also true when you're attacking the spirits in the heavenlies. Matthew 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom or the rule and the reign of the heavens, it's plural again, is suffering violence. Now, what's up there in the heavens? All the evil spirits. Who's been ruling and reigning? The evil spirits operating in the heavenlies. So the rule and the reign of the heavens, where the enemies have been operating, is suffering violence. That's force and violence. Who's bringing the force and the violence? The body of Christ, who has authority to get rid of those spirits and conquer them. And the violent, which are the strong, forceful, violent ones, which is you and me, if you have power and force in you. And how do you release mighty force? With your mouth, speaking. What are they doing? They're taking it by force or seizing control of it. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm, you're not asking the demons to leave or to hope they'll maybe pass off, pass away, or go away, or just leave. No. You're making them, you're forcing them to leave. You're using spiritual force and violence to drive those enemies out in a normal tone of voice. But it's coming out of you as you're acting on the Word of God and you command them to come out. You're to conquer everything that would come against you. And remember, there's a lot of enemies arrayed against you. Evidence of this, Luke chapter, or Leviticus chapter 26. Remember in verse 7 and 8 how you chase your enemies, which means to pursue after them, a hostile intent, and they'll fall before you by the sword, which is you speaking and commanding them. Well, was there just a couple of them? No. Five of you will chase a hundred. Well, that's quite a bit. Well, that isn't even hardly anything compared to the next part. And a hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight. Now, that's a lot of them. You might be working getting rid of thousands of demons out of you. And your enemy shall fall before you by the sword. We see the same thing implied here over in Psalms 91. Remember in Psalms 91, what it talks about in verse 7, A thousand shall fall at thy side. Why is that? Because you have been smiting them. And that's not all. 10,000 at thy right hand. You might be smiting thousands of them. Just keep doing it. Just keep casting them out until they're all gone. The more you cast out, the more you're winning the battle. The freer you're getting, the more you're winning the battle in the spirit. You say, well, I cast out some and I didn't see any change. You're looking in the natural for the change. You just keep casting out. The natural change will come when you've eliminated the enemy. Sometimes it changes as you're going. Other times it can just be constant and no change in the natural until you have gotten, gotten rid of all the enemies. We've seen that happen with so many people. Casting out for months and not seeing any change. And then all of a sudden, when you got everything out, all of a sudden you saw the victory and things were manifest. It's a matter of just continually winning the battle in the spirit to see the change in the natural. You might have seen some change and then there's more coming up. Well, that doesn't mean they've come back. That doesn't mean there's more there. As long as you haven't opened up the door through sin, you just keep casting them out. You keep staying on the attack to drive them out until they're eliminated. Now, we're going to have to engage in this. These are spiritual signs that are supposed to follow you. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Remember, we have authority, spiritual authority, in the spiritual kingdom. We use spiritual weapons, the weapons of our warfare. We engage in spiritual warfare. We get all the spiritual weapons from the spiritual armor. We got the spiritual sword that we're really putting in operation to smite all these enemies. And these spiritual signs are going to happen because you do the word. These signs shall follow them that believe. You're going to cast out the demons and you're going to see people get free. You speak with new tongues, take up serpents, which means to lift off, lift up evil spirits. They drink any deadly thing. Drink is synonymous with something coming into. They're all spiritual things. We're not talking about natural. The word is spirit. It shall not hurt them. Lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. After the Lord has spoken with them, he received up to heaven, sat on the right hand of God. They went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Otherwise, spiritual signs are going to follow the word. 
Notice, they follow the Word. They'll follow you if you're doing the Word. They're not going to follow you just because you're a Christian. People say, well, signs follow me. Well, signs don't follow you unless you're doing the Word, because signs follow the Word. You're confirming the Word with signs following. And what is it? You're doing the Word, acting on the Word, putting your authority in operation. Signs follow the Word. If you do the Word, it's going to happen. You will see the deliverance. You will see the healing. You will see the power of God. You will see the enemies being crushed underfoot. And that's what he wants. We see over in Acts chapter 4. How did they get things in operation? Well, they had to pray. Verse 29, Behold their threatenings, granting thy servants that all boldness they may speak the word. Stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done, spiritual signs and wonders, miraculous works in the realm of the Spirit, be done by the holy child Jesus. Who's doing it? The Lord Jesus is doing it through the name of Jesus. They prayed. The place was shaken where they were assembled together. Now, did they have a part to play in it? They sure did, because he does it through you and me who have authority. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost for the influence of the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Aha! They got their mouth in operation. Now they're putting the power of God and the authority of God in operation as they fight the, or the, speak the word of God with boldness, with great power the, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. Power is being released. Great grace was upon them. And what do we see happening over, as it records this over in chapter 5, verse 12? By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. The God, power of God is going in operation. The devils are being destroyed. The believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Insomuch they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on the beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. They came a multitude out of the cities round about in Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Man, these guys were really operating in authority and power and doing the mighty works of the Lord. These are spiritual signs that were flowing forth. Now they continued. Philip goes and preaches the gospel at Samaria. What happens? After he preaches the gospel, they believe these things. Talks about, he believed also when he was baptized, continued Philip, wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. Well, what were those miracles and signs that were done? It's back in verse 6 when he preached Christ to them. They were hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And what was he doing? The unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of him. He's casting out the demons. Many taken with palsy and lame were healed. Deliverance and healing was going forth. And signs. The signs that are to follow the word, when you, it'll follow you doing the word, when you're using your authority and casting out the demons and ministering healing. He wants signs to operate through you, and they will operate powerfully. At the same time, remember, remember, you don't follow signs, you follow the Word, because signs are the result of the Word. People that get off in signs are going to be in trouble. <laughs> remember what's going to happen. The devil is going to manifest, and he's going to deceive a lot of people and trick them, because he is going, this Antichrist comes on the scene, the lawless one, after his comings after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, you don't follow signs, you follow the Word. If someone's doing the Word, the signs will be there as the will confirm the Word with signs. If they're not doing the Word, then it's going to be a lying sign or a lying wonders and deceitful. This is why you cannot follow signs, you follow the Word. And that is what is going to produce the signs. God wants you and I to rise up. And he wants us to get so empowered and strong spiritually that we conquer everything. You've you got to get spiritually strong. And your strength is supposed to increase continually. In fact, here you see in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, this is talking about John the Baptist. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit. The same thing is spoken about Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. The child grew, this is imperfect tense, was growing, 
and waxing strong in spirit. This is Jesus talking about. He developed and became strong. Again, this is an ongoing work. Imperfect tense means past action, ongoing. It's like the present ongoing action, but it's in the past, in the ongoing action in the past that produced this. So, uh, all the time when you're doing in the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, working the Word, you're in, working it so that you're going to be growing and getting stronger and stronger. They became strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Paul did the same thing. Acts chapter 9, verse 22. Paul increased the more in strength and dunamo, empowered within. Well, what's that mean? He had the armor of God coming into him because the power of God was coming resident in him. That's the same word for being strong in the Lord. And then he was put in operation as he went forth. So you are to increase in power and spiritual strength in you by having the power of God resident in you. It's mandatory that you come to the place of being strong and, and having tremendous spiritual strength. Remember what happened with Stephen? Acts chapter 6. He was full of faith. And that meant he'd increased in faith. Remember, your faith grows exceedingly. And he was full of power, dunamis. If you're full of power, that means power is within you. That means you have spiritual strength. So basically, he's full of power and he's full of spiritual strength. And what did he do? He did great wonders and miracles among the people. He was casting out the demons, healing the sick, seeing the people be set free. This is what God wants. The spiritual work in you is to bring you to this place. He wants you to get established in your spiritual authority. You must be under authority to be in authority, and you've got to operate according to it with the specific operations of authority that we talked about. Binding, loosing, casting down, casting out, remitting, speaking the mountain, resisting the enemies. You also need to operate in the rule and the reign, the spiritual kingdom with the spiritual weapons, you engage in the warfare, you're engaged in spiritual fight continually, you're going to get these things in operation in your mouth, whether you're holding up the shield of faith or you're smiting the enemies with a spiritual sword, and you're going to have spiritual signs following the word that you're acting on. And you're going to get yourself to the place of being spiritually strong. It takes spiritual strength as a result of the power of God resident within you. You put on the whole armor of God, so then you are going to do the mighty works of the Lord, and you are going to conquer the enemies. God's spiritual work in you is to bring you to the place of functioning in the spirit, in warfare, in the kingdom, in authority, with power and with strength, continually putting it in your, through your faith, continually put in operation to see victory in every area, not only in the heavenlies, also in your own life, and wherever, whatever situation you might be dealing with you can overcome and conquer everything. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your spiritual work that is going on in my life. I thank you. I am under authority to the Father in heaven because I keep the commandments of Jesus Christ and I submit myself unto God, hearing and doing his word. Because I'm in authority, I operate in authority by speaking commanding words. As I speak commanding words, I know they're happening. It's working. And what I speak to obeys the Word of God. I understand the enemy has power to resist, but as I continue to speak, I continue to release authority and power to conquer all the enemies. I will operate as a king in the spiritual kingdom of Jesus Christ, using the spiritual weapons to release the spiritual authority. I will engage in the spiritual fight, spiritual warfare. I'm a soldier and I'm in active duty in the, in the army of the Lord, and I will engage in continuous warfare 
and fighting a spiritual fight with all the armor of God on, using my weapons, including the spiritual sword, making my mouth work for me to release the power of God, the spiritual force and violence against the enemies to destroy them and to see their works eliminated. As I do what the word says, and I get the word in me, I am becoming spiritually strong and I will continue to grow in strength and power within me. And I thank you that as I do the word, spiritual signs follow the word that I am doing. I will cast out demons. I will heal the sick. I will cast down the spirits from the heavenlies. I will move every mountain. I will resist every devil. I will remit the sins of others and use my authority to bind and loose, cast down, destroy the works of the enemy. I thank you for the spiritual work that you're doing in me and through me as I operate in the authority of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I will be a doer of this word. I will keep one hand on the weapon and one hand on the work. And I will always be engaging in the warfare to conquer all the enemies. Thank you for this great spiritual work that is being done in me and through me as I am a hearer and a doer of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Life is spiritual. Everything that you do is going to be operating in the spirit to put God in operation. But you're the one that's going to be working it. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word. We thank you for the spiritual work that you're accomplishing in all of us. And we thank you that all this, this authority that you've given us and the weapons and, and all the means in order to conquer every enemy and get spiritual strength, it's all available to every one of us. And we're going to do what the word says so that we see us operate in authority in the kingdom and see the spiritual signs in the comfort, confirming of the word come to pass the works of God be done we will see victory and we praise you for all that you accomplish in every one of our lives because we are hearers and doers of this word in Jesus name amen praise God hallelujah there's another